we want to welcome you. Thank you for being with us this evening. Merry Christmas to all of you. I hope that you saw this little video and I hope that it does elicit joy in you. For the last several weeks we've been preaching about this and we've been talking about unwrapping the things that God gifted to us. And one of the foremost, the title of the series was Unwrapping Joy. And unfortunately, Christmas comes around and boy, bills are tight and stuff goes wrong and things don't quite go right and sometimes joy is the furthest thing from our mind. But it is about Jesus, and I'm so grateful. What was that little lamb's name? Joshua? Is that what it was, Lauren? Is that what the lamb was called? I love, I love lamb. I'm going to leave it right there. I'm just going to leave it right there. I love lamb. Kids, love lambs. And I... <laughs> I'm leaving it right there. I... I so appreciate the fact that the God of the universe knows us individually. And the truth is, the truth is God really did design each of us in a special way. And I, for example, know full well that he designed me with hot legs. What? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I don't mean like, you know, ravoom. I mean like warm. Because if, if that weren't true, then my wife's chilly little toes wouldn't be on me. Like in the middle of, you know, when like her cold feet, am I oversharing? I'm probably oversharing. The point is, everyone has a purpose. <laughs> That's a vague way of getting to that illustration, Pastor. <laughs> no, it's true. Listen, every one of you has a purpose. Every one of you was designed, and, and the Word of God says, before you were even born, before you were even on this earth, God had conceived of you and knew what you were meant to be and what you were meant to do. And since we're talking about unwrapping joy, the absolute truth is this. If I don't know what God's plan for me is, if I don't know what he made me to do, if I'm not fulfilling that purpose, I'll never have fully, fully the joy that he meant me to have. There is no greater satisfaction than being able to lay your head down at night and say, God, I am right where you want me to be. Do we have issues and problems and, yeah, yeah, sure. We have things that we run into and, 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 and foibles that we deal with and all kinds of troubles that come our way. But at the end of the day, if I am where God means for me to be and I'm doing what he designed for me to do, I will have the utmost of what he meant for me. And that's what I want. I know about you this evening. So we're continuing to talk today about unwrapping, and we're going to just wrap this up this evening a little bit. And uh, listen, if I ask a child, in fact, let me ask a child. Anybody under 15, you're allowed to answer. You want to answer? You know what? What makes Christmas, honey? What makes Christmas to you? Love that is so sweet. Not at all what I was looking for. You're messing up my illustration. Thank you, dear. No, that's, that's good. That's good. What, what else? Little persons. Hold, you, you, let's, let's give somebody else a chance. What makes, what makes, don't mess, no, you, you messed me up a couple years ago. You're all sentimental and spiritual. No, what makes Christmas? What? Who's using a bear? <laughs> You're an adult. He's like, hey, da, da, da. no, it doesn't count. <clears throat> Listen, when I ask a child, go ahead, go ahead, one more. Jesus, he does make Christmas, that's right. Okay, let's, let's get back to reality because if you're sitting in your dining room or your living room or your kitchen and you say, what makes Christmas for you? Your kid's not gonna say Jesus, he's gonna say a PS4. Come on, let's just be, let's just be. And so, what makes Christmas? And sometimes it's a Christmas tree and, and, and maybe it's presents and if they're particularly special, they might say Jesus, right? Uh, Jesus was born and we spend time with family in our home and. And that's awesome. All, all of those are sweet things. And in our particular house, what makes Christmas, it would be, well, we all get to wear llama pajamas. Yeah, that's right. Full-grown man wearing a pajama with ears. I'm not into it, but I'll do it. I'm going to do it. Once, this, once, only once this year, llama, llama pajamas. I'm down because uh, that's how we roll, evidently. I wasn't asked or anything. It just showed up, and there it is. <laughs> and in my size, llama pajamas. All four of us going to be matching. I'm hoping no, nobody breaks out a camera. Uh, so here's the thing, <laughs> just real quick, because I know it's not, it can't just be us. Who wears Christmas pajamas on Christmas Day? Come on, let me see your hand. 
That's it? Oh my word, you're all Grinches. Nobody wears, oh wow. All right, I know what we're doing next year. Next year, everyone gets llama pajamas. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> the point is this. The point is what we, what we wear on the outside many times makes up what we are on the inside. Not always, but many times. And they say clothes makes the man and all of that. And everyone looks so nice today and all decked out and everything. And, and you look great. Um, but what you wear many times, what you wear kind of tells the world what you do or what you are, who you are. Not always. Not always. Nor should it. But it does. And kings used to wear these stunning robes, right? And the robes were always purple or red. Uh, because those were expensive colors to make. The, the materials were expensive. They were hard to get. And, and the colors, the dyes, all of that, difficult to come by. And, and so that's what kings wore. And beggars wore tattered robes. Tattered robes, rags, drab colors. Uh, things, that weren't, things that weren't dyed at all because they didn't have the money to do that. You know, you, 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 if you see somebody in a white coat, they're, they're tend to, chances are they tend to be a doctor or a pharmacist or something like this or a nurse, whatever. Police officers wear their clothing. Soldiers wear uniforms to indicate, you know, what station, what rank, all of that. And for good or for bad, the clothes that you wear, wear do say something about you, uh, what you do and your standing and all of that. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, it tells us about this cr Christmas miracle that God sent to earth. That's the miracle of Jesus Christ himself, our Savior. And I think it bears mentioning how, in what way, our literal Savior was born into this world. And, and this past Sunday morning, I preached on heroes, superheroes, and how none of them really exist, except that one does. Except that one honest-to-goodness superhero exists. And I went on to share how there's really no Superman and there's no Spider-Man. You could go around like Jaden looking for spiders to bite you. And I know he's unhappy with me right now. But a thing's going to get infected. You're not going to turn into a superhero. Sorry, that's it. See the way it worked. And I failed to mention the Hulk, which was somebody's favorite. Uh, there's no Hulk. There's, it doesn't exist. Then you get exposed to radiation, you're in trouble. You're going to turn into a crispy critter. Uh, and so I think it bears mentioning that Jesus is the only live, full, real, honest-to-goodness superhero we've ever known. The only one. And so I'm going to read this, Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And this is in the King James Version because of the way that it's worded specifically. You might have NIV or what have you, but Luke chapter 2, verse 7. It says this, this is talking about Mary. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The bringer of joy, the, the, the bringer of the joy that we're unwrapping and, and peace and the bringer of salvation, the redeemer was wrapped in rags, rags, strips of the cheapest material you could find. Nothing more, nothing more lavish than that. And he's brought into this manger. This, and this, by the way, when it says no room in the inn, it's, it's, as, again, it's not, we're not talking about a hotel here. We're talking about houses usually had a room where if a traveler came by, they could stay in the room that you had to give them. But this room was full. They didn't have any other spots. But what they did have is a spot usually built under the house or maybe a cave, or maybe something close by where they'd shelter their animals. That's the manger. That's where Jesus was born. That's where he was. When they say laid him in this crib, that's where it was. It was where the animals were. Why? Why a cave or a basement where animals are kept? When I arrive in heaven, that'll be one of the questions I ask. The next one will be, why shepherds? The bottom of the bottom of the heap of what you could do as a profession was a shepherd. They stank. They lived in the field. To be a shepherd was no, 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 no grandiose job. And, and listen, there's no, there's no job that you can do that you should be ashamed of. None. Whatever you do, you do it as honoring God. There's nothing to be, no matter what you do. But in that day, a shepherd was the bottom of the heap. Why were the shepherds the first to announce the presence of Jesus? Wouldn't you... Wouldn't you want someone, I don't know, a little more important? Wouldn't you, want to, wouldn't you want to announce him with somebody with a little acclaim, somebody with a little clout? No. 
No, he wanted the shepherds to do it. And so that's who the angel appeared to. Why the cloth strips? Why the cloth strips that were wrappings of poverty? Poor families in that time is what they did. They wrapped their infants up in whatever they could find, literally whatever they could find to keep them warm, right? Cloth was available. I'm sure they were clean. These people weren't stupid. I'm sure that these cloth or these rags were clean, but they were the cheapest of the cheap because they, they, they needed to keep that baby warm no matter what. No roaring fire, right? No pediatric little bassinet. No pediatric unit with a bassinet with a light, like, like warming, them, warming the babies up like french fries. You've been in a hospital, many of you, right? You see all little babies, and they're so cute, and they're like, they look like they're toasting french fries. Uh, you, no? Okay, it's just me then. Whatever. That's fine. None of that. None of that. They're just trying to keep the baby warm. Cheap rags, right? And... Ex ex <laughs> And it makes sense that a child born to the sounds of maybe a donkey, there might have been a donkey in there, there might have been some sheep, maybe some chickens, I don't know. We've already established they didn't have cows in that area. So the whole song, Away in the Manger, toss it, because it's silly, right? The cattle are lowing. No, there were no cows. No cattle are lowing. There's no cattle lowing. Just take that out of your head. That's pageantry. It's not necessary. If you like that song, I'm sorry. If it's your favorite song, pick a new one. But... Whatever. So this baby's born in this manger with a, a, whatever animals happen to be in there and rags. And why, why would God do that? What's the, what's the purpose? What was the premise of that? Jesus, the son of God, born in these conditions so that we would understand that Jesus never came to raise himself up to earthly glory. It's not what he came for. It's not what he came for. Even as a follower of Christ, it, it, it upsets me when I see other people who are followers of Christ trying to make a name for themselves. And I have to be very careful. Listen, when pride sets in, well, God gave me a wife and two little boys. So when pride sets in, it just gets knocked out of me like the next day. It doesn't last long, right? But it hurts me to think, as a Christ follower, Jesus himself came in a humble, poor estate on purpose to show us something. He came to serve, to teach, to heal, to sacrifice himself so he could rescue us. Right from the beginning, Jesus knew that. I don't know exactly what age Jesus knew that. I don't know exactly what chronological age Jesus was when he realized something ain't right. I don't know, did he heal a frog, bring it back from the dead? I don't know. I'm not sure, I don't know. But I know that Jesus knew that something was different and that God was his father. He knew, how do I know? Because listen, have you ever, <laughs> now some of you may not answer this or not want to answer it truthfully. Have you ever gone anywhere? Please answer me honestly. Have you ever gone anywhere, maybe church, maybe a store, and you forgot your child there and left? Just raise your, thank you, Jim. Thank you for your honesty. The police are waiting outside. No, I'm kidding. No, here, here at the church. <laughs> Listen, <clears throat> anybody else? Anybody else want to tell the truth and shame the devil? Listen, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I see that end. <laughs> if I waited, I'll bet you I'd see more hands. Look, the truth is, the truth is, here, here we go, in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, Joseph and Mary were in Jerusalem, and they leave, and they thought Jesus was with them. What does this have to do with Jesus knowing who he was? Just listen. They were in Jerusalem. They left. They thought, they thought little Jesus was in the caravan with them, but Jesus wasn't there. And they started looking around. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Where is Jesus? You lost the Savior of the world. I, didn't, I mean, think about this for just a moment. Oh my word, we misplaced the Messiah. Kind of a big deal. And, and, and the Bible says that they went to the temple and they found him. And Jesus, 12 years old, knows what his purpose is. He knows who he is. He knows what he's going to do. And this 12-year-old realizes that he will himself one day be sacrificed for the world. Wow. And he's 12. And his parents find him. And they're like, dude, what are you doing? How many times have I looked at my children and said, what are you doing? And Jesus looks at them and says, 
Don't you realize I'm supposed to be doing my father's business? Don't you realize this is where I would be? Don't you understand? This is my father's business. This is what I was made for. At 12 years old, understanding that his life would be forfeit. To do what? To bring me peace. To bring you and I forgiveness and grace and redemption. Wow. I couldn't care less about the tree. I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less if I get a present or not. Great. You got me socks again. Wonderful. I'm kidding. Every, she, my, I'm not talking about my wife. She gives me great gifts. I, 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 in fact, matter of fact, I could use some socks, come to think of it. Listen. Listen, Jesus knew what he was doing. He did it for you and I. And he knew as a child what he was made for. So tonight, tonight, Christmas Eve, I just want to encourage you and challenge you a little bit to say, ask yourself, ask yourself, in the quiet of your room, in the quiet of your houses, later tonight, after the you know, the turkey and the ham or, we you know, whatever's happening, tofu. I want to be careful here, right? <laughs> That's just sad. In fact, if it is tofu, come see me. We can set up an appointment for counseling. Anyway, listen, in the quiet of your room, ask yourself, am I doing what I honestly believe God is calling me to do? Do I think that I understand what God designed me for? And am I doing that? And you might be here tonight and say, you know, I don't even have, a, I don't even have an understanding about Jesus. I don't even have a relationship with Jesus. I've never accepted his sacrifice. I'm not walking in grace. I'm not walking in forgiveness. I, I'm really just kind of going day by day. Kind of whatever floats my boat, I'm doing. And I'm not very, I'm not very religious, pastor. Yeah, that's good. I'm not either. I'm not either. I don't need not a bit of religion. I don't need not a bit of pageantry. I don't need not a bit of tradition. I don't need any of that. What I need is relationship. And that I have. And that I have in spades because Jesus died for me. And he knew what he was doing before, I think even before he was 12. That's powerful. And I hope it stirs you up. And I do hope that encourages, that encourages you. Jesus is incredulous that he didn't that his parents didn't know where he was that Joseph and Mary didn't realize where is he he's a sacrifice I can barely get my 12 year old to put his socks on in fact I don't even know where he is right now Where's, where is Julian do we know <laughs> somewhere oh he's running, he's, he's running through the parking lot that's great listen I'm so I'm, aren't you aren't you moved at the fact that the creator of the universe knows you by name knows the number of hairs on your head, or the lack thereof, depends who you are, that's okay. No pun intended there to Pastor Ben, particularly, specifically. <laughs> and with as much emphasis as I can put on it. No, I'm done. I'm done. He's got facial hair, so though, he, God knows those too. God knows how many hairs are there too. Jesus' trip to earth was a rescue mission. It was a rescue mission. But as we've been saying the entire series, if I don't unwrap the gift that I've been given, it is worthless. Please don't tell me I hit the guitar. Lord, please don't tell me I hit the guitar. No, we're good. It's worthless if I don't unwrap the gift that God gave me. Worthless. But worth everything. If I do, I pray that you've unwrapped that and the joy that comes with it. I really do. From the video to the kids, I'm going to ask Pastor Ben to come. We're going to begin to wrap up here and we're going to have a candlelight service. And, and, and we're going we're gonna, to, I, what I want us to do is, as we're doing this, I just want us to be thinking about this. That joy that God has given us, that gift, the gifting that he gave to us. That it's our responsibility, our, our responsibility, our challenge to unwrap. When, when, once we do that, if I can unwrap the joy and the peace and the purpose that Jesus brought to me 
and gave to me through his sacrifice, then what it does is it makes me contagious to the people around me. Not contagious to get you sick. <laughs> want you to enjoy your trip. <laughs> uh, but it makes us a beacon of light is what it does. A Christian becomes a beacon of light wherever they go, wherever they go. My mom recently has started using this expression. I like it a lot. My mother sitting over there. Hi, mom. <laughs> Just wave so they know who I'm talking about. Le lately, recently, she's begun using this expression. She sa she's she's used, she's begun making this using this expression that you have everywhere you go. You leave an aroma, a scent, a smell, a, an aroma of godliness. We become. A beacon of light so as you hold that little candle I want you to be asking yourself am I sitting here fulfilling a few minutes because my dad or you know or my grandfather or my mom or what dragged me out here or am I really thinking about this there is a real Jesus a real Messiah a real Savior who died for me who wants me to live in peace and joy with purpose and to be a beacon of light, to leave off a sweet aroma everywhere we go. It makes people say, huh, something different about him. Something a little, where we work, where we go to school, who we talk to, where we go, where we shop. There's something different about him. There's something different about her. I kind of want that. Is that who we are? Or if they knew that you are a Christ follower, would they say to themselves, why would I want to be like that? They're just grumpy old Grinches. They're miserable. They're the biggest complainer at work. Oh, I hope that's not true. I hope that's not true. She's always, she's always late to class and offending the teacher. And I hope that's not true. She can't get along. He can't get along with. They can't. They can't even. I hope that's not true. Not of a Christ follower. We have issues. All of us have problems. But all of us, once we have an encounter with the Savior and unwrap the gift that He's given to us of joy, of peace, of grace, have the opportunity to find out what's my purpose. And then you become all that you were meant to be. And until you do, you won't. I'm not. I'm not saying that to offend anybody. Until we understand the purpose of what Christ rescued me for, because he loved me, he rescued me, he loves me, and he made me for a purpose, he designed me with it. And until I figure out what that is, I will never fully be able to have peace and joy and completely fulfill what it is he made me to do. Thank you for being with us tonight. We close right now. And, and guys, if you'll come, ushers, if you'll come forward, you'll begin. You should have received a candle when you came in. If you don't, if you don't have one, can you raise your hand? Ushers, can you look around? Is there anybody without a candle? Keep your hand up for just a second. Make sure that, okay, Jerry needs one back there. Can someone get him one? Anybody else? Anybody else missing a candle? Okay. We're going to close this evening in, in worship and in singing. And uh, I'm going to ask you to stand. And as we do, I'm going to also ask you to monitor your children. And as you hold your candle in your hand, we're to be beacons. Monitor your kids. Make sure they're not like, you know, setting your other kid on fire. Just make sure that we're being... And just let God touch your heart as we sing this. These aren't just Christmas songs. We're honoring an honest-to-goodness superhero in Christ, a Messiah, a Savior, a Redeemer. Amen. God bless you.
heavenly peace sleep in heavenly peace silent night holy night shepherds quake at the sight glory stream from heaven afar heavenly hosts sing hallelujah Christ the Savior Boy, Christ the Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God. Radiant beams from thy holy face With the dawn of redeeming grace Jesus, Lord, at thy birth Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Amen. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and spend some time. And God, we just ask that you would allow us to be just like the candles that we're holding in our hands, that we would be a beacon of light, contagious for peace and for joy, and that you would allow us to be a source of hope, maybe for someone near us, someone that we know, work with, maybe even live with in our own homes. And Father, for those this evening that are here that don't have that source of hope or joy, they themselves, I pray that you, your spirit would touch them and that you would lift them up, buoy them up, encourage them this season and that you would not allow anybody to leave this place with that question in their mind or in their heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Listen, if you're here this evening and you want to talk to one of us, Pastor Ben, or Lauren, or my wife, Andrea, or myself. Listen, don't leave here if there's questions that you might have, but see one of us as you go. Otherwise, enjoy your family. Love them. Enjoy the gift that you've been given. And, and I pray that you'd be able to unwrap and unpackage the joy and the peace and the gift that God's given us in the birth of his son, Jesus Christ. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday, God willing.